This is the famous Dota Bomasandra Lake in Bengaluru, a city that was once dotted with hundreds of lakes. These man-made reservoirs played a pivotal role in the creation of this city that was built by the famous chieftain of the Vijayanagara kingdom, Kempegowda, in 1537 CE. Sadly today, these lakes make news for the toxic waste that they are filled with and the grave environmental risk that they pose. With no river system to feed it, lakes were critical to provide the drinking water to this market city that grew in prominence over the centuries. As Vishwanath S. of the Biome Environmental Trust explains. So the lakes or the tanks of Bangalore have faced many challenges. When they were built, they were built for a very minuscule population, population of villages. In the 1870s, there was three consecutive years of drought in Bangalore and the famous thousand lakes of Bangalore were not sufficient to provide drinking water. There was drought followed by famine. A lakh people died in the old Mysore kingdom. At that point of time, the city rulers decided that they needed a permanent solution to the drinking water needs of a fast growing city. Remember, the population was about one and a half lakhs at that time. And so the city of owners or rulers built a reservoir called Hesargatta on the Arkavati River, about 20 kilometers away from the current city center, and started to pump water to the city. So in 1896, water started to flow into the city from pipes. At that point of time, the role of lakes as providers of drinking water started to diminish and the importance of these lakes and uh, tanks started to diminish. In the 1960s, this was followed by bouts of malaria. Malaria entered India in uh, at a large scale and started affecting the populace. So at that point of time, the then malaria committee formed by the city said that these tanks or lakes had started to collect wastewater and therefore had become sources of mosquito breeding and wanted them to be closed. So a second blow came in the 1960s. In the 1980s and 1990s, when the IT boom and the real estate boom started in the city, at that point of time, the real estate prices started to go up and therefore lakes had now to compete with uh, land prices. So lakes, which were no longer needed for drinking water purpose, started to be filled with construction debris, leveled up with land, and converted to sites and layouts. The state itself converted a lot of tanks into bus stands, railway stations, stadiums, and so on and so forth. And private parties encroached upon lakes and built layouts and apartments and buildings there. The threats of a fast-growing city, of a large population of high real estate prices, and unmanaged solid waste and construction debris resulted in the final blow to the lakes. The last insult to injury is coming when sewage or untreated sewage is flowing into water the remaining lakes of Bangalore. And now the challenge is how do you deal with protecting the lakes from encroachment, but also how do you protect lakes from sewage influ influx into it. While in Bangalore, water bodies that fed it are fast vanishing, creating an environmental challenge Across India, it is no different. A city like Mumbai is seeing its green cover disappear. The mangroves that played an important role in this coastal area have been replaced by buildings and this has caused a crisis worsening each year in form of disastrous floods. It hasn't helped that the Mithi River that has played a key role in Mumbai's growth is choked. Zoru Bathena has been at the forefront of citizen-led movements fighting for Mumbai's greens. The mangroves are basically help us with the tidal flow. Uh, when, when the tide comes in, if it goes through the mangrove trees, it basically helps reduce the tide forces. It's a, it's a natural tide suppressor. Unfortunately, in Mumbai, as of today, mangroves are Mumbai's biggest dumping ground. Huge amounts of truckloads of debris are dumped into mangroves all the time in all over the place you, in an unimaginable quantity. It's very difficult to go into the mangroves to see it because they're so thick and so, uh, first of all, they're out in the sea, they're in a marshland. So, normal person can't walk there. It's not that you can 
just walk into the mangroves and look what's happening. So there's a, there's there's very easy to dump things in there out of sight of everybody. Mumbai has faced a series of calamities since the infamous deluge of 2005. In fact, each year the city seems on the brink with promises made and none kept. The new ambitious coastal road project that the successive state governments have been excited about could make things even worse. Coming to the environmental damage of this coastal road. So the coastal road which is by reclamation is being the the, the land is being uh, the sea is being reclaimed in the area the zone between high tide and low tide. That area is filled it's teeming with marine uh, marine life. We have corals. Can you believe in Mumbai we have corals on our coast? There's like absolute gorgeous list of rare sea creatures rare uh, aquatic uh, plants which are growing in those areas the other issue mumbai is famous for is it floods in every monsoon why because the entire city is designed when the when it rains the water the it, the water drains out into the sea and when it monsoon tide and the tide is is at a high level so water simply cannot exit the city because the sea water is higher than the city the water doesn't drain out this is the biggest problem in which creates flooding in the city now in a city like that if you are going to take away a 100 hectares and god alone knows how many cubic volumes of sea by filling it up where will that water go If this is the problem in Bengaluru and Mumbai, India's other big metros face equal challenges. Delhi can't breathe for most of the winter months because of dense pollution and fires triggered by the farm fires in Punjab. Chennai faces floods almost every year because of the destruction of its wetlands and Kolkata faces a similar predicament along with rising air pollution. In small town India things are even worse. Five of the most polluted cities in the world are in India. Among these are Bhiwadi in Rajasthan, Faridabad in Haryana, Jaunpur, Bhagpat and Noida in Uttar Pradesh. Experts believe that most of the problems we face emanate from the huge pressure of population growth, urbanization and the apathy of policy makers. Jai Shri Venkateshan, managing trustee of the Care Earth Trust, tells us how Chennai's wetlands are disappearing due to these problems and how that affects the survival of the city. Despite the fact that they are most critical for the survival of the city itself, in fact, to make sure that the city is resilient and disaster proof, wetlands have been the most abused habitats as far as cities. city of chennai is concerned it's not typical only to you know any wetland complex that you see for the city it would have lost at least 70 to 80% of its original expanse the biggest challenge is urbanization that's also because most of the natural wetlands we're not talking about lakes and ponds which are largely man made here most of the natural wetlands which are de facto situated along the coast have all been redesignated into urban areas or industrial areas so this redesignation of wetlands into non wetland category is the biggest challenge and it's by far the only challenge that determines everything else we lost habitats primarily because of this urbanization however there is still hope organizations like the biome environmental trust in bangalore have done great work to clean revitalize and therefore conserve some of the remaining lakes in the city Jakkur Lake is one of the oldest lakes in the city its history d- dates to 1342 AD this was a uh, lake in the periphery of the city and as the city moved in toward towards the lake it started to see the usual construction debris dumping biomedical waste dumping and solid waste dumping but community uh, came together and decided to protect the lake took it up with the institution 
made sure that the sewage treatment plant, which was adjacent to the lake, started to function well and supply the lake with treated wastewater, made sure that a constructed wetland was designed to intermediate the sewage water, to polish it further, to clean it further and make sure that the lake is full. And in partnership with the fishermen who are taking care of the lake because of the fishes there, started to maintain and clean up the lake. In cooperation with political authorities and government institutions, the lake has now become a model for what's called integrated urban water management. As it stands today, with the global temperatures steadily rising and an increased pressure because of rapid urbanization, it is likely that adverse change in climate and weather patterns will be more common, and this will have a devastating impact. However, things can improve if we act now. For example, it should be made mandatory for the state to deal with recognized community organizations while planning projects which may be harmful to the surrounding environment. Planning for such projects should involve experts like biologists, environmentalists and the people living in the area who are the biggest stakeholders. State institutions should be staffed with competent, qualified professionals who will be able to engage with and mobilize stakeholders from the community. This will increase the outreach and link with the stakeholders. Citizen awareness of environmental issues is arguably the most potent mobilizer for right action and helps in applying pressure on policy makers and state institutions like the judiciary. We may not win every battle, but the noise created by the people helps to keep up the pressure on the people in charge to do the right thing.